most Flatpak users download everything directly from Flathub. Maybe you'll occasionally grab something from Flathub Beta, and maybe for one random application, you'll have a custom repo. But if you really want to, Flatpak supports adding in as many custom repos for as many things as you want to be supporting. And Fedora makes use of this in a really weird and interesting way by both making use of a custom Fedora repo and also a filtered version of Flathub. We'll start with the filtered version of Flathub because this is the much weirder one. Now, there's nothing special about Flatpak on Fedora. It works pretty much the exact same way it would work on any other distro. The only difference is the remote available by default. So traditionally, the only remote available would be the Fedora Flatpak repo. And if you wanted to go and make use of the general Flatpaks available on Flathub, you would have to go and manually add the Flathub remote. It's a single command. It's available on the Flatpak website. But as of Fedora 35, they added a toggle into the installer to automatically enable third-party repos, third-party repos being the Flathub repo. And this seems great. It makes it really simple for the user. Now Flathub works exactly the way it should. Except we're dealing with Fedora. And Fedora likes to make things overcomplicated for the user, leading to complaints like so. Files that should be available in Flathub are just completely missing, even though it should be enabled. Explicit packages like Spotify are just not available for some reason. And weird error messages about a filter stopping you from installing OBS Studio. And the reason for this is even though there was that toggle to enable third-party repos, it wasn't actually enabling Flathub in the traditional sense. It was enabling Flathub plus a software whitelist, allow list, whatever you want to call it, effectively giving you a filtered version of Flathub. Now you might think, oh, so this is Fedora, so the only things going to be included in that whitelist are going to be FOSS. No. As we saw, OBS, at least at the time, wasn't included in that list. So the criteria is as follows. Flat packs that will not cause legal or other problems for Fedora to point to. Flat packs that do not overlap with Fedora flat packs or software in Fedora that could easily be made into a flat pack and flat packs that work reasonably well. If I was going to care about one of these criteria to actually care about, three seems kind of reasonable. And point two also makes reasonable sense as well. If you're going to run your own flat pack remote, you probably don't want things to be doubled up. This would be really confusing to the user, so if it exists in Flathub, you might as well just go and not include it. I would argue that it makes more sense to do that the other way around, where if it exists in Flathub, don't include it in your own repo, but if they're going to do it like that, whatever. Point one is where it leads to quite a bit of trouble, because if you want to make sure that something is not going to be a legal problem to include, you need to communicate with those individual projects. And this might be fine for something that's FOSS, but what about if we're talking about a really big project where it's proprietary and maybe the flat pack isn't being officially run? So you have to go and talk to people that aren't actually doing stuff on Linux, get them to approve something being done on Linux. This seems like a problem. But hey, it's not like the filtered version of Flathub is completely empty. So they have had some success in actually getting this done. Obviously, also including applications where there couldn't possibly be any legal problem, like, you know, a calculator that's licensed under GPLv2 or MIT, things like that. But this filtered version of Flathub used to be a lot worse. Not just the fact that it was missing more applications, because it obviously was, but because the filtered version of Flathub didn't indicate that it was a filtered version of Flathub in the GNOME software center. If you're doing things directly from the terminal, it was pretty easy to see. But in the GUI, 
It just pretended it was Flathub. But you may notice in modern Fedora, the problem is no longer there. So the remote is still called Flathub, but it now has a different title. Now it's Fedora Flathub Selection. That is the name we see in this error right here. As you can see a bit later though, it does mention Flathub, so it can still lead to some confusion for the user. My suggestion, the suggestion of most sane people, and the suggestion over on the Flatpak website is if you're going to be using Fedora, go and add the proper version of Flathub to make sure it's the proper version of Flathub and not this weird filtered thing that's here for legal reasons. Now, initially for Fedora 37, the plan was to remove the filter. As you would know, if you're using Fedora 37, the filter didn't actually get removed because the plan got rejected. Not because they don't want it to happen, but because there were some concerns being raised over exactly what this is going to imply, so it's probably going to happen if it does happen for Dora 38, 39, or some point into the future, as long as they don't forget about it. The idea was going to be basically the same as the current filtered flat hub. It wouldn't be enabled by default, it would have to be opt-in by the user. I think it is kinda dumb to force the user to opt-in to make Flatpak work the way you'd expect it to work, but if you're gonna make it an opt-in situation, opting into a regular version of Flathub is a much better option. Now, while still having a legal component to it, because this is still Fedora, the Fedora Flatpak repo also exists for a more technical reason. Now, the first major difference is the way that Fedora Flatpaks are generated. When something makes its way onto Flathub, this can be done in a variety of different ways. This can be made from the source code directly. It can be done from an app. It can also be done directly from an application binary for something like Spotify, Discord, and things like that. In the case of a Fedora flat pack, these are generated directly from Fedora RPMs. Now, one of the major benefits you get from this is if it's already a Fedora RPM available on Fedora, it already follows Fedora's application distribution guidelines. Most notably, it's already going to be FOSS. So everything in Fedora Flatpaks is going to be FOSS. So that means no Spotify, no Steam, no Discord, none of these align with what Fedora is trying to do with their Flatpak repo. If you want to install those, you should install them directly from Flathub instead. But the other important thing you get from it being an RPM is the applications available in the Fedora Flatpak repo are going to get the same level of support that any other application on Fedora is going to get. And depending on what you do, having that first line of developer support might be incredibly valuable. For other people though, it might just be completely worthless. Now, another major difference is they use a significantly different container format. On the Flathub side, Every flat hub is going to be using OS tree. This is akin to Git for binaries. Basically allows you to roll back through the history in the same fashion as Git. This is what I was using to make OBS work during the issue where things weren't working like they should. Whereas over on the Fedora side, they use something known as OCI. This is the Open Container Initiative. Fedora is not doing anything special here, both of these are generally supported by Flatpak, it's just that Flathub only uses OS tree. If you have a custom repo, you can use whichever one you want. Now, OCI is a lot more similar to something like how Docker functions, because it's made by Docker, and Fedora already offers a lot of Docker images. This format makes it incredibly easy to create a Docker image from that flat pack, avoiding the need to learn any extra tooling to have a functional flat pack remote, but offering a lot more support and doing things in a very different way doesn't come without a cost. So right now over on Flathub, there is 2,039 applications. Over on Fedora Flatpak, which you can go and use on any other distro, 90. 90 packages. But, 
I don't know how many of these 2,000 applications are up to date, are actually good, are actually usable. Whereas with this 90 applications, it's a much more curated set that you can be sure is usually going to be of much, much higher quality. Now, the other major difference is the way the runtimes work. You may not know this, but flat packs do actually have dependencies. So if I install something like OBS, it's going to install the KD application platform alongside OBS. This provides the QT support and a bunch of other things like that. Now, if you install a GTK application, you'll get the GNOME application platform instead. So if you only ever install KDE applications, you'll never have that GNOME application platform. This isn't the way it's done in Fedora Flatpaks. In Fedora Flatpaks, there is the Fedora Flatpak runtime that everything uses. So basically it just grabs it all at once and then doesn't have to deal with it again. And considering that you don't just have random people submitting flat packs, it's this very curated list and you know exactly what you want to have available on Fedora, doing it like this isn't exactly bad. It does mean that initial download is going to be considerably larger, but then it's just something that's already done and downloading subsequent packages is going to be a touch easier. So neither method is really wrong, it's just two different approaches to achieve the exact same goal. So that's the way that Fedora handles flat packs. I know if you're a Fedora user, you probably know about all of this already, but I didn't know about the Fedora flat pack situation until like a couple of months ago, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of people out there who had no idea either. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. And if you like this video, remember to go and like the video. And if you really like the video and want to become one of these amazing people over here, you can check out my Patreon, Scribes, and the Pay link in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over T. I've got a gaming channel called Brody on Games. That's going to be it for me. And I'm out.